Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, the book of Deuteronomy. The law that Moses gave in uh, uh, lay terms, whereby everyone can understand the law, not given by some highfalutin priest or someone that would speak in terminology that would be difficult to follow, but simplified and laid out by Moses himself, direct to the people. This will be Moses' last address in as much as he will return to the Father 30, about 30 days after he's giving these lectures. So I find it fascinating, simple, easy to follow, and God's advice to man on how to get along with his family, his brother, his government, his nation, and most of all with our Father to receive his blessings. It's very important the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 23, verse 24, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father and let's get with it. It reads, when thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, not yours, that that means a neighbor's, then thou mayest eat grapes thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. Now let's go one more verse and then I'll comment. 25, when thou comest into the standing corn, of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. In other words, he has the harvest rights. Now, at the time of this writing, they did not have uh, restaurants along our, our freeways. They simply had pathways, and God's own nature was the only way you could partake of food. And so it was customary that you could eat your fill and then move along, but not put any in pockets. That means to carry more than you would eat at that time, depend on someone down the road to feed you. Uh, this, is, this is well and good, and it's as it should be among a people that live together, work together as a nation and a people of taking care of their own. Our Father teaches us compassion. This is compassion. And if someone is in trouble, and that's what this would uh, consist of if it were updated to this time, is somebody that's had a breakdown or something of that nature, a flat or something else, you know, and it happens to be in your part of the country in busy cities anymore, it's very dangerous. Uh, to stop and try to help anyone because of traffic and otherwise. So that's therefore we have um, employees of the government that supposedly will uh, block traffic and so forth when there is problems. And that's, that's also well and good. But um, compassion taught by our Father to think of your fellow man. You know, that's, it's wonderful to be a helping hand when people are in trouble. You might think, well, that really cost me. No, it never does. You know why? Because God will fill your bushel. He knows, and his blessings come from people that follow his advice and and allow that compassion to exercise, be exercised freely. But never forget the rights of harvest. That's to say, take another man's material that is his at harvest time, for he is the one that that uh, produced the perspiration, sweat in producing it. Chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it came to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanliness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. Now, the term here, some uncleanliness, in the Hebrew is nakedness. 
there is great controversy, has been for years and years, between scholars of the word as to what this means. And about half say, well, that means adultery. No, no, common sense will tell you better than that. I hope you haven't forgotten what back in chapter 19, the penalty for adultery, that is to say for a betrothed one, to be caught in a field with a nice death. So it didn't say right or a divorcement, it would be death at the time of this writing. Of course, this is old law, but it lets you know how our father um, believes and he, or how he would rather have you understand because this lays the foundation in a sense of, founda- of uh, salvation itself. And, and I will, because we are working forward to a wedding feast, a marriage. And this has a great deal to do with that and is played upon in the New Testament by our father there. Now let's continue on verse two. He's, he has divorced her. It would definitely have to be some reason less than adultery. I will put it that way. I think it would be that they simply were not compatible. All right, verse two. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. She's free to go ahead and marry. Now, the reason this law that we're about to read is passed is that there, God wanted to, in as much as he had approved divorcement, he didn't want any frivolous divorces. That is to say, everybody just for no good reason. So what did he do? Verse 3, and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, verse 4, listen carefully, her former husband, that would be her first husband, which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Now, what does all this mean? Well, it mean, it, again, the penalty was, you let her go, she's gone, she's gone for good. That cuts down on frivolous divorce. You better know what you're doing. You better have your heart and mind set and know that you can't just divorce someone because you want to. But the stronger underlying point is this. I want you to turn with me over to Jeremiah. You're not going to have it on your screen. Jeremiah chapter 3. And in verse 8, I'm going to read it. You won't have it on the screen. And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorcement. God divorced Israel. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So God divorced Israel. Now, however, by the very law itself, when Christ died upon the cross then she was free to remarry again. All right, I'm talking by the um, law concerning widowhood. A widow can remarry. There's no problem with that. So Israel had the ability to remarry. Now, in the situation that we have here, I have, you would be surprised how many letters and notes that I received saying my first wife and I, after we have both been married to others, have decided we would like to remarry. And naturally, meanwhile, when our father, Emmanuel, God with us, that is to say the son, died upon the cross, then he freed us on repentance to be clean, not unclean, clean. Meaning, if you had uh, committed a sin and divorce is a heartache and, and uh, some, someone sinned or there would be no divorce, they fell short in some way or the other, and usually it takes two to tango, okay? That's why a counselor never, never gives advice until he hears both sides and, 
analyzes it very carefully. Only a fool will give advice on hearing one side, and many people are hurt that way. But be that as it may, with the price having been paid on the cross for the forgiveness, for the forgiveness of sins, it certainly includes adultery or the byproduct of divorce, meaning you have a clean start. Well, does that mean then that a man could remarry his first wife? Well, I have to believe that when you repent before Christ, you are a new creature, that you have a fresh start, and that he will bless your marriage in remarrying that first wife. However, the reason the law was given, if you could not, now I'm going into my opinion now as a counselor and as a teacher, of God's law. The reason God would do this in the physical sense, when we were speaking in the spiritual plane concerning Christ on the cross, forgiveness of sins and so forth. Now, but the physical, if you remarry a first wife, it is natural if you could not, the two of you could not get along the first time, then that love had better be proven and strong because it's gonna be a lot harder the second time. I said it's going to be a lot harder the second time because there's been a lot of water running under the bridge and it takes very mature people that their love accepts a person as they are because there are many times, I'll just, let's see, I always use this example in teaching this. Uh, he might wake up in the morning when she pulls her, the biscuits out of the oven and say, hey, you know, I was married to so-and-so. Her biscuits rose a lot higher than yours, sugar. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just things happen where, you know, it's, if you couldn't make it the first time, you start running these comparisons, and it's very difficult sometimes when things are a little tough to not allow something like that to slip in. So if you didn't make it the first time, it's going to be terrible the second time if you don't have the real thing, love and trust Christ for forgiveness and, and, uh, and forgive yourself and your mate. I said, you must forgive yourself because you added to it, you know you did. And you must forgive her totally. And as Christ gives you a new start, it must be exactly that. Because in repentance, it makes you both basic, basically, if you would, the same as virgins again, spiritually. So take that fresh start and make a good life of it. This is one of those cases where Christ did not change the law, but he fulfilled it. And that's why he would say in Matthew chapter 5, I come not to change the sound of one letter of the law, but to fulfill it. So that perhaps within that, if a person has ever experienced this situation we're now speaking of, and they know now that they have that total joy in marriage, Christ paid that price for you on the cross that you could have that total joy in marriage, a good Christian marriage, the best marriage there is. Greatest gift God has given man and woman is a good mate. And don't ever forget it. If you got one, you take care of her, and you take care of her right. If you have one, you take care of him, and you take care of him right, and God will bless. All right, verse 5 to continue on. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, that he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he had taken. Now, did it say train his new wife to do what the bossy old husband wanted? No, no that, that wouldn't cheer her up. I don't think uh, you take some mucho macho. I, I think a man should be a man. Don't misunderstand me. But one of these mucho macho guys that...
So then the term cheer her up, and uh, in the Hebrew, it could even be translated. Let me think real quickly a moment. It could be translated to give her assured happiness, assurance that you, you can provide for her and that you can cheer her up and make her happy. That's what the man is supposed to do. And quite frankly, any time that you cheer a woman up, which God expects you to do, and make her happy, I guarantee you, you don't have to play the mucho macho. She'll do anything in the world for you. Why? Because she loves you. That is just the nature of humanity. It's pure, it's simple, and Moses does an excellent job of teaching that uh, very thing. And that's why God wants a newlywed couple to have that time were that they may be happy. Verse 6, No man shall take the neva, that's the lower, or the upper millstone to pledge, for he taketh the man's life to pledge. In other words, that particular thing is indispensable for the man to make his daily food or his daily living. Don't ever take a loan on what a man has to make his uh, his money, his living, his life with, and then expect him to have something that he can work and pay back. This is why the usury is a curse almost if it reaches the point that it's, it is like taking a man's, um, if you charge too high of an interest rate, there is no way the man can catch up. It's, it's, a, it's one of the greatest sins in the world. And God's against it. He doesn't like it. Usury to anyone but your brothers, fine in that sense. And then you must take each case individually, but be that as it may. Never take to pledge. Let's say that a man, let's say that this, this would be the, an analogy. A man mows lawns for a living. And his wife gets sick and he says, I, I got to have a little cash here. The guy says, well, I'll, you give me your lawnmower and I'll loan you uh, um, three or $400. Well, how in the world is a man ever going to pay you back to three or $400 because you got his lawnmower unless you're going to get out there and mow his lawns for him? I don't think you'll be doing that. And that's why God is saying, don't take advantage of a poor person that needs help or even as far as that's concerned, a person that's independent. If you take away his means of uh, prosperity, you're robbing him, all right? The greater sin than even this is false teachers that take away a man's soul, his life, by teaching falsely. That is to say, not teaching God's word. That is a sin above sins. Is someone that plays preacher and misleads people by teaching traditions of man rather than these scriptures, the letter God has written to you, which cannot fail, solid advice, common sense, for each and every person to participate within, using God's rules of not taking advantage of people whereby all can find peace of mind. But um, a, when a man takes another man's soul, that's a heavy trip. I'll say more about that here in a few verses. Seven, verse seven. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and making merchandise of him and or selleth him, then that thief shall die. Now, I want you to let that sink in real good. That covers kidnapping. That covers bondage. And thou shalt put evil away from among you. Now, again, like I said, and I will add to it, stealing a soul is worse. That's, you're, if you are a false teacher and you steal a man's soul away from the living God, his word, the simplicity of it, and teach him a bunch of gobbledygook, butterfly stories, 
You don't have to understand God's word. Just follow me and you'll fly away. And God states in Ezekiel 13 in this letter that he has written to you, I am against those people that teach you to fly to save your soul, covering my outstretched saving arms with pillowcases or kerchiefs where you can't see the simple plan of salvation that God says I have put before you. I don't know, do you listen to fairy tales like that? I don't know, a lot of people do. And those people that steal those souls, what is the penalty? Death. The sad part is, it's a spiritual death. Well, at least they won't have too far to go because they're spiritually dead already, and I'm not judging, that's just a fact. Anytime you teach contrary to God's word, that's the penalty. God, does he wink at ignorance? Well, I'm glad he's the judge and I'm not, aren't you? Verse eight. Take heed in the plague of leprosy that thou observe diligently and do according to all that the priest, the Levite, shall teach you as I commanded them so ye shall observe to do. This has to do with those parts of the priest law that are concerned hygiene, cleanliness, taking care of yourself. If you participate in filth, then you're gonna get sick, all right? If you participate in filth that is especially perverted and unnatural, you could get a disease that will kill you and there's no cure for it. It's called AIDS. Is there a cure for it? You bet there's a prevention for it. Follow what the law says and you'll never have to worry about it. Leprosy was spread by contact, basically. And if you obeyed the priest and stayed the proper distances that were um, set for the ability of the disease to carry itself or whatever means or method, then you didn't have anything to worry about. The same is true today. I, I received many, I have received many, many letters of people that study with this pastor in God's word that would write and say something to this effect. Oh, but to God I had met you over 10 years ago and the word, I would not be dying with AIDS today. Well, as I stated, take heed in the plagues and observe diligently. That means you think about it very carefully. Hey, it's your decision. It's your life. It's your life to do whatever you choose with it. Hey, have a good trip. Verse nine. Remember what the Lord thy God did unto Miriam, by the way, after that ye were come forth out of Egypt. Now, here, here is something that you want to be very careful of. What God is adding to this as to the contact of spreadable diseases, God put it upon her as a method of correction. And you snubbed the father enough He'll see to it that the filth catches up with you if you participate in filth. I don't care what kind of methods that you might think you're averting or doing. Because he, Miriam, that poor little, that wonderful little girl that when Moses was pushed off in the basket into the, the crocodile uh, bed, meaning the Nile River, and she was walking along the bank in those reeds guarding that little boy Moses who God is using to write this. And after she was taken by Pharaoh's uh, family, even had the um, knowledge and wisdom to go up to her and say, I, I will go find you a nurse for this baby and went and got his mother. You know, This same Miriam began to badmouth Moses at uh, after the escape from Egypt. And God whopped leprosy on her. So do, if you, you go ahead, you might be one of those that'll say, well, there he goes, just yakety yakking about AIDS and we like what we do and we participate in it. God might just turn around and whapo you, just like that. 
You don't believe it? Well, hey, I don't know. You you like to take chances? You probably are. Maybe you better go get tested right now. You probably already have it. Verse 10. Now, I, I want to say, I want to insert something here. Many people might say, well, that sounds a little sarcastic to me. No, it isn't at all. It's because I love you. I want you to know that when you participate in filth, you can die. And God has things for you to do. Why? Why would someone be so stupid to do something like that when they have God's service they could perform in a destiny rather than death? I don't know. I, I would think anyone would choose life, a fulfilled life, a happy life over death. That's the reason I speak in such a manner, is to wake, shake the trees, and cause knowledge and wisdom to prevail and to cause people to service God, to serve God for the purpose he intended in the first place, rather than enjoying plagues. There is no such thing as enjoying plagues. Verse 10, when thou dost lend thy brother anything, thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge. And um, this loses a little bit in the translation because this is talking about a poor brother. I mean somebody that is really poor. Well, let's go one more verse and it will document that, okay? Verse 11, thou shalt stand abroad and the man to whom thou dost lend shall bring out the pledge abroad uh, uh, unto thee. One more verse and then I'll comment. And if the man be poor, thou shalt not sleep with his pledge. All right? Now, now I've got to go another one. Okay, 13. If any, in any case thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down, that he may sleep in his own garment. In other words, a poor person only had a one top garment and that was his warmth at night. Uh, and bless thee, and it shall be righteousness unto thee before the Lord thy God, meaning the Lord thy God will bless you. Now, why is it that, well, I loaned him my chainsaw. When he's got it right in there in his house, I'm going in there and I'm a-getting her. Well, you can't do that. A man's home is his castle. That's his dignity. You don't, you don't abuse someone's home. It is theirs. I don't care if they're renting or whatever the case may be. That is their castle. And God expects you to treat it accordingly. And you do not go in ransacking or taking. You don't even go inside the door. You stay out the gate. Because it, that man, that's why a man has dignity when he has his own place, whether it's rented, leased, or what. That's his domicile. He is king of that mountain, that hill, that, dom, that um, place. And again, you allow him to have his dignity. You take a man's dignity and a good man, you've ruined him. So God said, think, respect a man's castle, his home. That's his place, and you don't abuse it. I don't care even if you own it. You don't abuse that man's right. If, he, if that's his uh, domicile, you do not injure his rights as a human being has and deserves rights. And um, the poor, you certainly don't, if you take something from him that he needs, now, then you return it. Now, many people abuse this. Now, we're not talking about some beggar that's not even trying. We're talking about a poor man that's trying to get ahead. There's no sin in being poor. It's a sin to stay that way. And uh, from generation to generation to generation, when you strive, you help that person. If, if, it's some, if it's just an habitual beggar that is never going to work and expects to 
at the um, compassion of good people to sponge off of them. Hey, I won't feed him. And again, many are going to say, well, what a terrible thing for a pre pastor to say. No, you harm him if you feed him. God's word states very clearly for, uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, if a man won't work, you don't feed him. Do you know what man think, uh, God thinks about lazy people? In Proverbs, he likens them to a door hinge. Only instead of a door to the frame is the lazy person is a hinge to the mattress. All he can do is just turn from one side to the other. What's he fit for? Just to wear out mattresses. And I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any demand for somebody that all they do is wear out mattresses. All right? So don't, don't try to help some person like that. It's, they must learn to want, I repeat, want, underline, they must want to help themselves. Or you can't help them. You're wasting your time. So don't, don't, uh, uh, and, and I suppose maybe uh, I'm overcautious, but when a good law like this comes along, that you don't take advantage of the poor, I like to know who, who do you think the poor are? The poor are those that certainly, because of illness, sickness, uh, because of um, bad mistakes, lose everything they've got but want within themselves to build themselves back up. Now, you have that person down and outer, you want to try to help him. But now, a person who has a decent job, a person who rents, leases, or owns their own home, they have a roof over their heads and their family's heads, eat well, that is to say healthy, they're not poor in my mind. They're not poor at all. They have, they have pretty well everything that is needed to find peace of mind. And I do, not, I do not, nor do I think our Father considers that being poor. Being poor is, and the reason that the terminology was utilized, the Hebrew is much more specific. Don't take a man's only garment, top garment. That's the, well, let's, let's call it his coat. Because it's going to get cold tonight, and he's going to need it. And you took the coat to buy him a bowl of soup, and you're going to let him freeze tonight? Uh-uh, God said don't do that. Try to help him if he's trying to help himself. Okay, well, I, I, I can't finish the chapter, so I guess we'll stop there for today. Our Father, though to some it may seem strange, because this was, uh, was written about uh, 1,400 years before Christ walked the earth. So naturally, the everyday situations do not fit with what we have today, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the analogy of what God is saying. He's saying, have compassion, love your neighbor, love your brother, and be a good person. And what, would, what did God say he would do? I will bless you. And I'm going to tell you something. Without God's blessings, you're not much. You may think, well, I'm flying high today. You won't be in a day or two. You won't be in a year or two. A person that doesn't have God's blessings is a short streak of nothing. You know, they here today, gone tomorrow. And never finds peace of mind nor happiness. The only way you can find peace of mind and happiness is to obey your Father. After all, He's the one who formed and created these bodies. He knows what it takes to make them happy and healthy. And that's why He wrote you this letter, so that you would eat what He has told you to eat, to maintain it properly, and that you would act and react with a, in, within a community, as he has instructed you to, whereby you could have your dignity and could be successful. It's up to you. It's all your choice. Don't ever, ever try to blame your shortfallings on someone else. You're the one that listened, and you're the one that went for it. So don't be a crybaby and, uh, and expect a pity party out of this boy because you're not going to get it. 
I, I don't go for pity parties. That won't get it done. What gets it done is can-do type people that says, well, shake it off and get up and do it right this time and you'll be somebody. That's what God wants you to be, a good child. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. All right, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, please share it. Please never ask a question about a particular denomination, individual, or organization. Let's just teach God's Word and let those little hot chips fall wherever they may, all right? They are, they, they are excellent. They are an excellent healing bomb for man's mind, body, and soul, all right? Now, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure hearing from you. You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address. He's your father, he knows what you're thinking, he knows your heart, he knows your mind, he knows your body, he knows your soul. There's nothing about you he does not know, so don't think, well, I'd like to talk to him, but I don't want him to know about it. <laughs> he already does. He's waiting for you to say, Father, help me or Father, teach me, or whatever the case may be. He has an open mind and a very generous heart and blessings. Think about it. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen, amen. Okay, let's see what we have on people's minds here. We're going to get into some questions. And Elizabeth, we got from Georgia. What does it mean by overcome? Well, now you don't, Elizabeth, you don't give me a scripture, so uh, you mean the term overcome? To overcome means, less, it's according to what your subject is, and without a subject, it's very difficult to answer this or to try to answer it with what might be in your mind. I'm going to do it in two ways then. I'm going to say that. One way of overcoming that we think of is for us to overcome the ways of the world by accepting our Father's way. Then you are an overcomer of this world, and you are an overcomer. That means that you overcome anything that might befall you with the help of God, and that's a good thing. Now, just the other way, you have some old boy that likes the bottle a little too much and it's got old bad spirits in there. And if he lets that bottle overcome him, oh, just, I love the Lord. And let me have a little, I love the Lord. And the evil, and the, the spirits in the bottle begin to talk louder than his own spirit. And pretty soon they just swallow him. And you're listening to the spirits from the bottle there then. But that's the way it goes. He's overcome by the bottle. So overcome is a term that means basically just what it says, all right? You can be overcome by good or bad. Bradley from Texas. The Bible says if a man does not work, he shall not eat. I am going back to school full time. Is this considered working? Of course it is. You're working to improve your mind and to be a blessing and a good uh, uh, serve, uh, 
per, a son, a child of God, whereby you're a blessing in the way that you help others and at the same time are repaid in, with rewards of progress, all right, of success. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's not a, being lazy as going to college, okay? Janet from Arizona. Why did God choose Adam and Eve from, for the garden? Was it because they were in the first earth age and they loved God more than Satan? Well, most, most likely. I, I think you would find your answer in Romans chapter 9, where God stated concerning Esau and Jacob, uh, es Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And then he speaks of Pharaoh as to how he caused Pharaoh to persecute Israel. Pharaoh would probably, if God hadn't hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh would probably have given in and let him go a long time before he did. And then God says, hey, look, I'm the potter, and, and, and you all are nothing but a big lump of clay, meaning we got flesh bodies that our bodies are sustained by organic minerals, uh, energies, and so forth that we intake. We're clay. All of that grows from the clay, the soil, earth. And he said, I form and shape, and I mold, and I make people whatever I want them. He will never, at the same time, know this. He will never intercede in a person who has free will only. Now, a person, as it's written in Romans chapter 8, the prior chapter that before the one I'm quoting from, 9, uh, he stipulates there that he will intercede in the lives of those that overcame in that first earth age. He said they were, I um, preordained you and justified you. It means That means I judged you there and judged you worthy. And he said, don't talk to me, the potter, as to whether I take, and I'm going to say it from the Greek just like it is, okay? I can take that same lump of clay and in one, I can make a water pitch, a flower pot rather, and, or a chamber pot. In other words, being the potter, you don't want to argue with him because he can pick you up and just toss you. And you know what happens to pottery when it hits the deck, all right? Now, Paul, uh, Acts chap uh, Romans chapter 9 will answer your question. Paulette from Florida. Genesis, was Tamar an outsider, but she was in Jesus' uh, line uh, lineage? Uh, darling, you missed the whole, some way or another, you missed the whole story. It's quite the contrary. She was not an outsider. Tamar was of the tribe of Judah. Judah was out whoring around with, um, uh, with these other people's foreigners at sheep sharing time. He, I mean, he liked to play hard, I guess, or something. I don't know. But, and, and naturally, he finally took one of those foreigners for, a, um, um, for a, his a, a wife, or at least it wasn't, a, I don't know if you'd call her a wife or not, but be that as it may, his sons were not really of the tribe of Judah. They were of this other people sired by Judah, which made them unfit to be in the genealogy. Therefore, Tamar, when one of the, the sons would go to take Tamar, God would kill him. Because we were talking here about the genealogy of Christ, so God killed them. Well, that sounds very rough to me. Well, it just lets you know how God hates adultery, which is uh, uh, means uh, you don't hook up a mule with a, a horse, all right, or an ox with a... That's why God teaches those things. So finally, God caused Tamar, because the, uh, the only way she could produce a seed through which Christ would come was from Judah himself. She had to play the harlot. And I, I think that Tamar was a very brilliant woman because she asked for, oh, Judah was on his way to another party and he didn't have any he didn't have his credit card with him and when she played the harlot he couldn't pay so she said hey i will have a pledge so he left his what was it his cane his staff uh, let's say and it seemed like it was something else be that as it may and then 
when Tamar conceived, but when she um, was found that she was pregnant, Judah just raised Cain. We'll get rid of her, do away with it, that awful, awful girl. And Tamar was very gracious to old Judah. She says, by the man who owneth this staff am I pregnant. And Judah changed his whole tune. I don't know why. I wonder why he would. All right. Anyway, Tamar was a wonderful person. And um, it's too bad that Judah didn't work as hard at serving God as she did. Dorothy from Louisiana. My son was terminally, terminally ill with a neurological disease. He was a Christian. However, he took his own life. Will he still go to heaven? Well, Dorothy, that's up to God. You know, a, a preacher that will play God is, is walking a dangerous line. So I, you know, I can't say that, but I can say what God's law says. All right. So to say whether he's going to heaven or not would be pretty difficult because I, uh, I don't know the full story of what his life was like. If he loved the Lord, he certainly, we have uh, um, an up there. Now, a person who has a, a, a toxic chemical imbalance or an imbalance because of disease or sickness, uh, sickness is not themselves. Now, I have to be very careful on this subject because there are many people that are, that have a toxic or chemical imbalance Therefore, I have to weigh my words very carefully, and yet at the same time, I want to comfort you to say that God doesn't go out looking every day for somebody to zap or to send to hell, because you can find out in reading 2 Peter chapter 3, what is it, about verse 7 or 8, God wants everyone to repent and be saved. Why? There is children, and he loves them. So uh, disease is not accounted uh, a person that is, is not in their, um, oh, well, I'm going to stop there, all right? I think you can figure that out. I, I uh, do not like to discuss on television every situation is totally different, and you have to know all sides of every situation before you can give assurances of anything. Tim from Wyoming, why doesn't the Bible mention dinosaurs? Well, it, it does, Tim. Haven't you ever read, what is it, the 40th chapter of Job, where it speaks of the behemoth? And here it describes the behemoth. His thighs, his legs are so huge and so strong, they're like iron. And here's the catcher. His tail is like a cedar tree. Now, that's not talking like the cedars we're speaking of here are the cedars of Lebanon, all right? They're huge. And there's only one animal that has ever been created that has a very huge tail, and that's a dinosaur, okay? And especially in as much as it was speaking of the first Earth age. Aaron from Mississippi. What happens to us when we die? Well, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this body is present with the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, instantly... When that silver cord parts called life and the earthen pot breaks, the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, meaning the soul instantly returns to the Father, and this body goes back to dirt, which is where it came from, and what it is, and that's what it'll always be. It ain't going nowhere. It will not ever be resurrected. The resurrection takes place not of the body, the flesh, that is to say, but of the soul, and that happens instantly. We that are alive today cannot precede anyone that has already died. Why? To the Father, because they're already there. It's that simple. Bill from Maryland. Do you believe that there is a rapture? Not as is commonly taught. Number one, the word rapture is not in the Bible. It was made up in the year 1830 by two preachers that heard a, a disturbed woman talking seeing visions, and boy, did the church grab onto it. We will gather back to Christ, but it will be as the Bible describes it, not as man does. 
if you note, even in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's the last trump, just as Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52, the last trump that Christ returns and we meet him. The last trump, of course, in the Greek is very specific. It's the furthest one out. Now, if there's seven of them, which one is that? How can anybody, how can anyone, when the Greek is so specific, the last one and there's only seven, uh, duh, let's see, duh, it's got to be the seventh, right? Of course. Now, the Antichrist, the false Christ, comes on the sixth. So, what do I believe about our gathering back to Christ? And I choose to use that terminology over your word rapture. It stays very clearly that the false Christ will come at the sixth before the true Christ comes at the seventh. And the reason God converts people to Christianity or has conversions into Christianity is to have Christian soldiers that will stand up against the lies of Satan and document that they are worthy to serve the Lamb. And uh, we gather back then at the seventh trump. He gives us powers and victory over our enemy, even Satan. Documentation, Luke chapter 10, verse uh, 19. Uh, Chad from Illinois. I recently found out that Lucifer is the, in the Hebrew tongue means the bright and morning star. When Christ speaks of himself being the bright and morning star in Revelation 22, does that have any correlation? Well, sure it does. Satan steals every name Christ picks up, chooses to carry. Why? He's the opposite. He's the fake. Even when he calls himself Christos, as Christ calls himself Christos, he is known as Antichristos, but he still picks the same name. Anti in the Greek doesn't mean like you'd use antifreeze in a car or be against freezing. It means instead of. Satan comes first instead of Christ, and many people that think they're going to fly away are going to jump on his little uh, uh, twin-engine flutter bug and fly to hell if they're not real careful. It's a dangerous time. And I don't, I don't say that sarcastically or anything, but it's dangerous to not study God's word because he loves obedience. And if you listen to lies and people that would steal your soul and sell you short, you better wake up. We're in a generation that's, that's very delicate. Anita from Maryland. Did I understand you right that to commit murder is the unforgivable sin? Please clarify. No, you did not hear me right if you heard me say that. I stipulated that as it is written in the first epistle of John, not St. John, the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15, a murderer cannot have salvation in his soul. That's why God ordered capital punishment in Deuteronomy chapter 19, which we just taught. Why? Because capital punishment sends the murderer to the murdery who is present with God. And God faces them off. And probably, now this is just my opinion, the murderee will have a whole lot to say about whether there's forgiveness for the murderer. That's why a murderer, as long as he is in the flesh or she, cannot have forgiveness, and God demands capital punishment, number one, so he cannot murder again, and number two, because there's somebody up there waiting on him that he murdered, and they want to have it out with him. Let him duke it out in the highest court. That's God's court. Does he go... He's going to look over at this person he murdered and said, do you think we should send him to hell? Because he took your life and you could be down on earth having children and your children having children and now all of your genealogy is blocked up because of this person. What do you think we should do with him? I, so I don't know. What kind of chance does a snowball have in hell? Well, I don't know. Thank God, it's, judgment is up to God. But in this case of a murderer, I think the person he murdered has a lot to say with whether he'll go to hell or not or have salvation. But I guarantee you one thing. 
if I had murdered someone, I'd pray a lot. I'd repent, repent, repent. Though it won't do any good, you should be executed whereby you can get there and get it over with. I don't know, that's up to you. Um, now, in this land, I want to make this statement, we do not execute murderers on our own, even if we're kinsman redeemer, as the Bible states. We have to obey civil law. Only civil law can execute. But then don't worry. There are no unsolved mysteries, and God's going to get them there sooner or later anyway, and they've still got it to go through. No, it's possible that a person could probably find forgiveness for murder, and again, there's the snowball. I don't know. You sure want to think deep, long, and hard before you blow somebody away if you're a little old teenager out there and you finally found you a pop gun. Be real careful. Think deep. Dean from Oklahoma. When the Antichrist comes, how, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to get Dean's tomorrow. I was just... Why? When the Antichrist comes, how long will it be until the true Christ comes? Revelation chapter 9, five months. Out of time. Hey, I love you all a bunch. And the reason being, you love to study God's Word. And most important, that causes God to love you, and that brings His blessings to you. Thank Him for the Word daily. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you once you do that. But there's one thing that's much more important, and that is that you absorb His Word, that you hang on to it in your mind. Don't don't uh, make little notes and pin them in your hair or anything. Keep it in here because you may have something come up that you didn't have a Bible present someday. So keep it in your mind. Stay in the Word every day in the Word. It's a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.